All right, fantastic. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the first virtual Military Veterans Healthcare Virtual Lunchtime Series. Uh, my name is John Parody. I'm a member of the Bay State Health Planning Committee that organized this series, and I'm gonna be serving as your moderator today. Uh, I'm also a member of the Western Massachusetts Veterans Outreach Project. I'm a retired military veteran, and uh, we have developed a really strong curriculum, which we hope over the course of the next several weeks will reach as many community health care providers as possible. Our goal is to increase your knowledge and uh, I shall say uh, cultural competence in understanding the unique and often very specific health care needs of U.S. military veterans. At the conclusion of this series, um, you will have the confidence, I believe, in knowing when and how to appropriately refer veteran clients and with accessing the available community resources which assist veterans. Our entire series is free, thanks to Bay State Health and the work of their community partners to include the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Central Western Massachusetts Healthcare System, the Central Hampshire Veterans Services, and the Western Massachusetts Veterans Outreach Project. Before I introduce uh, today's lecturer, I need to mention a few administrative notes. Um, You'll see in the chat room, and I'm going to give you the code right up front so you have it. If you want to jot this down, it's S O K Q A V. That's the course code. I'll repeat that S as in Sierra, O as in Oscar, A as in Kilo, Q as in Quebec, A as in Alpha, B as in Victor. S O K Q A V. That's your course code. Um, you can also, if you can text it to 413. 2002444, and that'll get you through the MS, MMS into the uh, course content so you can get credit for the uh, course. Um, there'll also be a, a post assessment that you'll need to complete to receive credit for the CEU or CME opportunity. The second note is to remind you to provide us with a course critique and to sign up for our other courses, which will be held this month and into December. We also have some courses lined up in January and hope to have them available for registration by the end of this month. So be sure to return to the Bay State Health Education page to find available listings. And um, finally, throughout today's lecture, if you have a question, please type it in the chat room and then um, either throughout we'll pause to take questions or at the end at the conclusion, we'll go through and we'll address uh, questions as you have them. Um, we'll have plenty of time for audience particip participation. We've left time at the conclusion of the lecture uh, for discussion. So let's begin today's lecture. We couldn't have picked a better uh, lecture to kick off our series than Dr. Janet Hale. Uh, Dr. Janet Frazier Hale is a professor emerita of nursing and family medicine and community health and the former associate dean for interprofessional and community partnerships in the Tangent Bend Graduate School of Nursing at the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School. As a critical care nurse and subsequently as a family nurse practitioner in the military, much of her focus has been with cardiac patients and efforts towards interprofessional and patient education to support wellness, health promotion, and disease prevention. The courses she teaches to graduate nursing and medical students at uh, UMass address the determinants of health with a focus on the impact of the non-medical determinants of health, including a history of military service on individual and population health outcomes. She also supported Commonwealth Medicine's educational component of UMass Correctional Health, and more recently, based on her military service, she partnered with Commonwealth Medicine to educate a subcommittee of the Massachusetts Legislature about the long-term care services, supports, and housing needs of veterans They'll project out for the next 20 to 50 years. That resulting report informed a 2016 bill in our Commonwealth's General Court that supports the special needs of aging Massachusetts veterans. Dr. Hale retired from the military after 33 years of active and reserve military service. Among her awards and honors are the 2018 Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Teaching and the 2019 University of Massachusetts Manning Prize for excellence in teaching. Military awards include the Legion of Merit, Bronze Star Medal, and five Army Commendation Medals. Most recently, she was appointed to serve as a trustee on the Board of Trustees 
of the Chelsea Soldiers Home in Chelsea. We are so honored to have you, Dr. Hill, as our first lecturer in our series. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, John. It's really nice to be see you again. Um, I always enjoyed my work with you over the years. So um, thank you for this honor. And thank you to those of you who are participating. It's a relatively small group. So John, um, feel free to interrupt me with questions or suggestions or if somebody can't hear or whatever. Um, so I don't want you to panic. There are 84 slides. The last 13 of them are um, actually a total of 14 of them are just the references that I've cited that I've used. Um, I can tell you that the world of uh, veteran health care through the VA is changing on a daily basis. And you'll notice in many cases I've added in something that just has been come across my desk um, in 2021. Um, Nothing, you shouldn't be expected to memorize any of this. Um, you're not going to be tested. Um, but it's just to give you a general overview and understanding of some of the behaviors um, and some of the really awful um, diseases and uh, injuries that can result from military service. So keep in mind, too, that, you know, I talk about the more extreme cases. Um, versus, you know, the average military service member. Um, uh, a lot of the focus sorry. is on... Sorry to interrupt you. I think you stopped sharing your screen um, one way or another. I may, actually, I think someone may have accidentally taken control from you. Okay. So now I'm back to share. So, yeah. How's that? And it's coming through. Yep, that's perfect. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I don't. I don't think I touched anything. <laughs> no, you didn't. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um. So yeah, but a lot of the diseases and the things that we're going to talk about are have been predominantly those who have been in the infantry, um, who are subjected to some of the most traumatic events in the military. So. Um, you know, I want to. I hope I'll keep remember reminding you that as healthcare providers, our role is to care for those who are um, are injured and ill. Um, that's why I joined the military, and um, that's why many of those in the helping health professions have joined the military. So, um, so basically, um, when you ask somebody about culture, they might just casually say. Well, it's just how we do things around here. Um, and for the military, it's much more formalized um, and enforced. Okay, so now I'm trying to change. Okay, that's uh, forwarding the slide. Okay, I'll have to use that. So um, this is my disclosure slide. It's also a photo of um, a licensed practical nurse who was standing on the burn when we were deployed during the first Gulf War. Um, we, when you're in the military, sometimes you have a number of jobs to, to um, keep your community together. And we were a community, we were a hospital of 400 people, 400 beds, and we were basically transported to uh, the corner of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq to provide um, evacuation uh, health services to those who were injured. Um, for our own protection, we built a rudimentary bore uh, berm with the help of the engineers. Um, but then, of course, you have to protect yourselves. Somebody has to guard the berm. So the different um, soldiers um, took part in that as well. So basically, our overall goal is that you um, appreciate how military culture will influence the behavior and the health outcomes um, of your patients and your friends and possibly family members, or even yourself if, you're, if you are a, a former service member. So these are the objectives. Um, hopefully, we'll accomplish them. There's certainly plenty of slides. Should help to do that. So. so to start out, I just want to give you a basic understanding of military culture. Um, and how to sensitively ask the question of patients or persons about their history of military service. 
Um, and you want to know because it, it has significant implications um, on their health. So this is basically the definition, one of the defi many definitions of a veteran. Um, the military has a lot of customs and rituals and protocols. I've just thrown up a couple of pictures here. Um, the American flag that's draped on the bed, um, that's from a soldier's home. You have one in polio. Um, I was honored, um, sadly, but honored to join my colleagues from Commonwealth Medicine um, early in COVID when um, the soldier's home was having some issues. And um, a number of my colleagues and I um, came down and did a lot of training on infection control um, for the staff and for new, new hires. Um, I also, uh, John mentioned the report that we wrote. Um, in our report, we had supported um, some changes, and I'm happy to say that, um, that they are now building a new state-of-the-art soldier's home in Holyoke. Um, I also want to thank those of you um, who may have taken some of our um, our ill soldiers um, into your hospitals or your nursing homes or whatever when we were when we were trying to um, you know upgrade the care um, of them. So if you were involved or you know people that were involved, please tell them thank you um, for helping us out until we could help um, the home get back on its feet. So there's also pictures of a funeral, um, which is usually, um, it's a very uh, poignant uh, event in the military, um, but certainly honors the dignity of the person who has passed away. Um, in the morning when they raise the flag and in the evening when they take down the flag, those are very sacred events as well. Uh, soldier members will stop whatever they're doing if they can see the American flag to salute um, and civilians are encouraged if they're on a post or a base to stop if they can hear it and see the flag and put their hand over their hearts. So it gets very confusing. I don't expect that you're going to really, um, you know, totally uh, appreciate this, but there are a number of branches in the military. The main ones that you know are the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines. Um, and now we have a new one, um, the uh, Space Space Force, um, so I put that logo on this slide just to show it to you. But there's also the Air National Guard, the Army Reserves, the Army National Guard, um, the Air Force Reserves, the uh, Navy Reserve, and, the, and you also see some Coast Guard. The Coast Guard and the Public Health Service are not considered um, armed services, their uniform services, as is the National Oceanographic and Aeronautical, whatever, in NOAA. <laughs> um, sorry. And um, so, you know, the active duty are the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, um, and the, uh, but the National Guard and the Reserves are probably the most important for those of us in the state of Massachusetts, because there aren't a lot of um, active duty bases other than Hanscom, um, and it's small. Um, and so the majority of your military folks are National Guard um, and with a smaller uh, reserve force. And this is going to become important because, as you probably, you know, if you've seen the news, you usually think of the National Guard as supporting state needs. Um, and certainly the National Guard has come through during the COVID crisis now with some of the, you know, driving buses in some of the communities. Um, but they can also be called up in, and perform in a federal manner. And as you've seen from the last 20 years, the National Guard in Massachusetts, as in many states, has carried a, a significant load of, of, the, of the work overseas. So... Um, so they're very important people, and we'll keep talking about them um, as we move along. So um, in the more in the military, rank and order are important. I'm just showing you some of the ranks. You know, the more senior the person, the more responsibility they have. Uh, the lower the rank, they're they're more you know frontline, um, <clears throat> more hands on with with what's what's happening in whatever their specialty area is. Um, it's very confusing. The different services have different um, insignias 
Um, and that really doesn't contribute other than the slide just shows you that there is rank and order um, in a hierarchy and it's all part of the discipline um, within the system. So basically, regardless of their childhood, um, those who have served, we all share a common bond, a sense of duty to our country and to each other. And um, it's also a very uh, great socioeconomic status equalizer. You know, you all come in at a lower rank, whether you're enlisted or officer, and you, based on your performance and your behavior and time, you, you can move up the ranks. Um, and um, nobody cares whether, you know, you came, your family was wealthy or poor because you're going to wear the same clothes and you're going to do exactly the same things as someone who um, may have been on uh, welfare. Um, and I think the interesting thing was when we deployed, when I was mobilized the first time um, and we went to Saudi Arabia and we lived out in the desert, you know, and we had no water, no electricity, everything we had to bring in. Um, and so we had a three-star general's wife who was part of my reserve unit um, right along with the, uh, with the privates. So, and we all worked together. It was, it was really quite impressive to see. So basically military, they like routine, they're punctual, they usually, they're professional, they're usually, they, you know, they, they're supposed to stay clean. We're loyal to the mission, we're loyal to our colleagues, we look out for our buddy um, to the point that if your buddy is injured or killed, you will go back and risk your own life to save them and bring them back to keep them in the fold, in whatever condition they happen to be in. Um, as I mentioned, discipline, hierarchy, respect, integrity, and courage. Um, but on the other side of the slide, it shows you sometimes if you, when, once you, you know, been in the military and then you come back and you try to transition back into a civilian setting, um, some of those values that you had may not be quite as important. Um, and so I'll have another couple slides about this and then we'll move on. So, you know, obedience, regimentation, it was important um, that you put yourself, you put the group above yourself. You'll, you're willing to sacrifice your life to save your colleagues. Um, we have very strict rules of behavior. Um, and the way the military rewards you, they can't give you bonuses for the most part or, you know, an extra day off. Um, but you can earn medals. And so the picture on the right shows you the medals. And so people have done some amazing things to earn these medals. And in the military, when you're wearing your uniform, you wear the medals and people can see and learn a lot about you from your medals. But essentially, when you come home and you, you're back as a civilian again, especially if you're a reservist or a National Guard, you know, they're basically meaningless. It has no meaning to the people around you. And you're, you're completely back into your civilian world again. And that transition can sometimes be pretty difficult. Um, and this is, I think, the last slide that basically shows you that when you're deployed, um, you're, you're told what to wear, what you're, you know when you're going to eat. It's always ready. You don't, you know, they, you usually get your uniforms cleaned, except if you're, you know, really remote and you have to hand wash them. Um, you know you're going to get paid. You know if the army needs you to go someplace, you're going to be transported there or they will help you walk. Um, and so many decisions are made for them. Um, um, and the decisions that you make in the military are usually really important. They're for security. You know, it's a life and death decision when you're caring for um, a patient or you're making a decision. And so it's quite a pivot to come back to civilian life when you've been deployed. Um, and now you, you have to make mundane decisions like, OK, what am I going to wear today? You know, what am I going to cook for dinner? Where are, you know, gee, I have to take this to the post office and mail it. Um, what am I going to buy at the grocery store? You know, and to us, you know, these are just normal activities of daily living. But to somebody who's been deployed for a while or in the military, where you always can go to the dining facility to eat, and you, you know, you always have a pack to sleep on. Um, you know, this can be, it can be a significant transition and overwhelming actually, depending on how often and how long people have been deployed. Um, and so again, like I said, you know, most of us, the 
on this call, um, I think are healthcare providers, health professionals. And so for those of us who have gone in as a health professional or as a medical service corps or in the support, the, the military support structure is much greater than the than basically the, the war fighters or the fighting forces. Um, and we're there to support them with their mission. Um, but those are the folks that may be on the front lines who are expected to kill. They are maybe constantly being a target of being killed. Um, and so um, the others have witnessed death and horrific injuries, either as um, a frontline infantry person, but also as a healthcare person working, you know, in, in an emergency facility, if you're a medic working on the front lines. Um, and then, you know, we haven't heard so much recently, but you think of John McCain and, um, and some of the others who were um, prisoners of war and subjected to torture. Um, and these are kind of heavy things in some cases to deal with. And that's why we always want to be sensitive when we ask our patients if they have a history of military service um, and be cognizant of the fact that they may be bringing a lot of um, you know, challenging um, baggage and history um, experiences with them. Uh, moral injury is a relatively new term. I'll have another slide later on. Um, but it is basically, it's been a spin off a little bit from post traumatic stress disorder um, and how, you know, how whatever caused the post traumatic stress. Um, actually has wounded the soul as well. Um, and so it, the, the literature is quite recent, um, as is the treatment for it. Um, and I can tell you that in Western Mass, there's a place called the Brookfield Institute um, that's doing wonderful work with, um, with um, the veterans and the former service members who are suffering from moral injury. Um, so you might in your practice and, you know, see somebody and uh, might want to connect them with a place like that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's a very, it's a really tough, tough um, situation. And I think um, if you think about our Vietnam veterans, who are some of the, the um, I think theirs is a very sad situation. Um, um, as you, most of you are probably too young, but the Vietnam War was not well supported. It was our last major um, uh, war or military initiative where they drafted you. So, you know, now we have people who generally join because for some reason or another, they want to join. Those in, during the Vietnam War, we were drafting and bringing people in at such a rapid pace. And these are people who had absolutely no interest. You know, they're not war fighters. They didn't want any part of the military. And they're forced to go over there um, and in a very unforgiving um, environment and, um, and do what they're told to do. And then the, to add insult to injury, when they came back, um, they were blamed for the war. And they were spit on um, and they were mistreated and disrespected. Um, so they, they are really a very sad, challenging group, but a group of folks that if you can get them to open up and reveal and talk to you, you can provide them immense um, support. And just by thanking them and showing your appreciation and just by listening, silence is golden when you're often when you're talking to a veteran. Um, so it, this says many veterans return changed, some return changed, but you know, we all change. Every day you leave and walk out the door, you come home at night, you know, you're a different person than you were when you left based on the experiences that you had today. Um, some veterans um, have more resilience and they adjust well, they can compartmentalize. Um, if they're active duty, you come back with people that experience the same things that you did. You've got the whole support structure if you live on a base or an army post. Um, and so those folks fare usually a little bit better. Um, but if you're an Army National Guard or Air Force Reservist and you're coming back from, you know, three days ago, you were, you know, in Kandahar, Afghanistan, and you come back and they have a couple of days of you know, and then you're home and you're back at work and you're supposed to be just the way you were when you left, uh, given what you've experienced. 
Um, but you come back with a lot of excellent traits, which we'll talk about as well, which makes us, you know, former service members, really very, very good employees for the most part and people that you want to have on your team. Um, but again, you know, some research changed and really struggled, um, especially the Vietnam veterans, I think, really have struggled a lot over the past 50 years, which is really very sad. Um, and being sick is diametrically opposed to the, the persona that we, or our, our military folks, want to be and, and what they want to convey to the outside world. Um, some of us feel that it's not worth your experiences to talk with people who weren't there and who don't understand it. Um, and so you can read these. I'm not going to necessarily review them with you, but um, it kind of helps you to explain um, why people, why veterans are often reluctant to um, to speak up because they will pretty much never tell you that they have a history of a military service if you don't ask them. Um, and just a point: when the soldier, especially the uh, the reserves of the National Guard soldiers, deploy, um, you know, most have many have families. Um, they've got jobs. They've got a civilian world, a civilian community. Um, and they might be one person in a whole town that goes, or their children may be the only child in an entire school who has a parent who was in the military or who deployed. Um, and so, you know, and, and need people to support the children and the wife as well, or the husband, depending, um, to let them know that, you know, they're there to help and that they understand. And if they are upset, they need to talk or somebody who's going to listen for them, listen to them. So um, now I just want to mention to you some of the great factors that veterans, former service men, members bring to, to you. Um, uh, this, and they talk about this, which was um, a special training, had nothing to do with health professions, but the factors remain the same. Um, and again, I'm not going to read these to you, but these are some of the skill sets that a, that a veteran brings home with them. Um, and they can bring them to the family, they can bring them to the job. Um, and in fact, just the last two weeks uh, here at UMass, we have <clears throat> a population health clerkship course. And one of the groups that the medical students and the nursing students can select from is, <clears throat> is a veteran's military health. And it's a two week immersion within um, the population that, that the students choose. Um, and in our group was a, uh, a graduate of West Point who served five years after he graduated <clears throat> and applied to medical school. And when I was going through these slides, you know, he said, yep, he said, that's exactly why I got into medical school. And basically it was because of, you know, obviously he must have shared some of these traits and abilities that he brought. Um, so... And again, these are the factors are there to the left, um, confidence under pressure, dedicated, um, adheres to schedules and deadlines. These are all things that would be real valuable to your employees. Honesty, punctuality, team players, um, and now many of them from the recent wars are used to working in a global environment. So we're transitioning a little bit now. Um, and again, this is why you know you all have been invited to participate in this um, in this presentation or this series of presentations. The majority of the former service members are receiving their care outside of the VA. So many people think, well, you're a veteran, you served in the military, you go to the VA for all your care. And as health professionals, we're some of the most ignorant about this. Um, but increasingly, veterans are being seen in the communities. One, um, either because they live too far from a VA facility, or two, that they don't qualify. Just because you served in the military doesn't qualify you for VA care. Um, and there's a, and they have a whole tier of, of explanations, and it's way too much to get into. And it's even hard for some of the people that work in the VA to explain their tiering schedule for how it's financed. But but the bottom line is, if you're hundred percent, if you're considered hundred percent disabled from being in the military, then you can get all your care at the VA, and it's excellent. You get dental, you get vision, you get it all. But the way they calculate disability is pretty interesting. Um, 
And so if you um, come back and you've lost a limb, you know, that's maybe 25 or 30% disability. So they'll take care of the missing limb. You know, they'll give you the replacement parts, if you will. Um, and they will be state-of-the-art replacement parts. Um, but that's all they're going to take care of in the VA. You get the rest of the care of your body you get on the, uh, in the civilian community. And so um, once we move on, there'll be some questions that you want to ask. You know, you want to ask your, your patients, you know, do you have a history of military service or have you or a loved one ever served in the military? And if the person says yes, then you'll go on and you'll ask, you know, oh, so are you being cared for at, in, in the VA? Um, and they may say, yeah, I only go there for hearing aids, you know, and then so you never know what they're going to tell you. They may be, you know, getting some of, but some of their care. But in, in an effort of providing holistic care, if you can communicate with their VA provider, then you can provide them better, um, you know, whole, more holistic care. Um, also, you may be seeing some people who are um, active guard or reserve who may be on TRICARE. And if they're on TRICARE, then they are going to be seen outside of military treatment facilities as well. So you may have some of those in your population. So even though they're active duty, they're, they're being, you're being paid through the tri TRICARE insurance for their care. I know this is really complicated. Um, I wish I could, I wish there was a way to make it simple, but um, it's, we're not there. Um, so basically, we know that most civilian providers don't ask about military service. Um, I think more and more it's getting into the, the patient record, especially EPIC. I know they, in many cases, they have a, a question, you know, and it, the question they say is, are you a veteran? Well, that's loaded right there, which we'll learn in a few minutes. But anyway, this is just the research to support the fact that the majority of us do not ask um, our patients. Um, I can tell you, I think probably, I don't know if there's any um, EMTs or paramedics on this um, call, but my, um, I have a friend who's, uh, who's a paramedic, and he indicated to me that at least within the group that he works with, that they will they ask that question fairly much, very close up front because of the significance it has on the early behaviors and the, and the uh, opportunities for the person who's in this particular emergency situation. So kudos to those of you who already are asking the question. Um, these are just the references to support that slide. Um, and then there was a more recent study in 2020 where they um, interviewed um, advanced practice nurses about um, their interviewing skills and they, their results were the same as with the, the uh, physician providers. Um, they just don't even think to ask or they feel like they don't have the competence to care for those who have served and so they don't want to know. Um, they have no way that to collaborate with the VA. Um, and that mostly they say that it's their own ignorance that they, they're either afraid because of what they see in the media, they don't understand the culture, um, and so on. So hopefully... As we can progress along, um, I can help, you know, allay some of those concerns. So why do we want to ask the question? Um, well, it's really important. Um, and the way to say it is, do you, a family member or a loved one, have a history of military service? Do you, do you or anyone, you know, anyone close to you have a history of military service? And you specifically don't want to ask if they're a veteran, although that's what you're going to see a lot. Is because some people have served and don't consider themselves a veteran for a variety of reasons, which we'll go into shortly. Um, and you certainly don't have to be a veteran to care for a veteran. Um, so anyway, so this is the sensitive way to ask about military service. And you can't tell by looking at somebody whether they have his, whether they're service connected. Um, you know, unless they're now the World War II and the Korean folks you know, more and more now they wear their hats that identify the unit that they might have been in. You won't see that generally. Very few Vietnam veterans will do that. And I haven't seen many of the, of the recent um, Gulf Wars on terror um, do that as well. So um, sometimes you can tell by a tattoo and you can say, oh, so tell me about your tattoo. And then they may tell you, they may not want to tell you, but um, that, you know, that's another way. But basically, um, that's a woman up on the left. So, you know, all veterans don't, don't have buzz cuts. 
um, stand straight, say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Um, so the women, we are now 15, between 10 and 15 percent of the military forces. If you look at the gentleman and this provider over on the top right, you're not going to know that he's a command sergeant major who spent uh, four tours in Afghanistan if you don't ask him. Um, the far right in the middle, that's the fog of war and the confusion that sort of circulates around it. Most of our um, service members come home, um, which is represented in the bottom right. Um, in the middle, some of us, some of us don't. Um, and then some of the wounds of war are visible and some are invisible, which you can see from the gentleman in the bottom left. And sadly, the woman in the middle with an um, arm coming up over her, um, her lips um, is, uh, you know, is many of the many, some of, there's a, unfortunately a look too large of a percentage of women and men in the military have suffered from military sexual trauma. So if you ask them that question sensitively um, and they acknowledge their service, then you're going to want to say, well, are you involved in the VA? Um, and this is going to be important for you to know, as we discussed previously, because they may be receiving some of their care in the VA for whatever that service-connected concern is. And you will want to try to provide coordination of care as much as possible with the VA providers, if you can. Um, it all takes a lot of work. Um, I rely on your medical assistants, your social workers, you know, any support staff that you have um, who can help you out if you're a physician or, a, you know, an advanced practice clinician. Um, RNs, LPNs, um, you may be the, the, the key to connecting the folks who are making the clinical decisions with, um, with, the, with the other uh, collaborating with the VA. Um, and the VA has these PACT PAC teams um, so that each of the patients that's being seen through the VA has a number, he has a team of, or she has a team of people caring for them. So the more information you can get about or from them would be great. Um, you can ask, the, you can encourage your veteran to, uh, your former service member to use My Healthy Vet. They just have to go right online. Um, and then you can continue to take their history to ask them about their branch and their rank, and those will become important as we move through. So if they say yes, but they're not enrolled in the VA, um, you have no way of knowing whether they're eligible for any benefits um, or care. Um, and I guess I think for me, the saddest thing is for veterans who, um, who could be receiving compensation for the issues that they're experiencing. Um, and we may have never even thought to apply um, later on. And the good one is prostate cancer, and we'll talk about it in more detail, but um, the Vietnam veterans were all pretty much all exposed to Agent Orange, as were the people that were working at Westover Air Force Base on, um, on the planes during the Vietnam War. And that's important to know, um, I think, just because you may be the first person to say, gee, you have prostate cancer and you were at Westover during the Vietnam War, um, you know, you're likely to be able to be compensated. So anyway, I have an example of a, of a gentleman who um, had prostate cancer. He'd been to Vietnam. Um, I kept saying to him, you know, you really should register with the VA. You're eligible for compensation. No, no, no. There's others who deserve it more than I do. Um, well, the VA has the money and, they, and it's meant for you if, you if you're the one who needs it. And just because you say no, it's not going to go and give somebody else more than you're getting. So, you know, and that's a big thing to try to convey to the veteran. If they, they've earned the right for the compensation if they qualify. So anyway, the gentleman with the prostate cancer waited seven years, finally went to the VA when some of his golfing buddies suggested it, you know, rather than me. Um, and um, he, uh, you know, signed up. And since then, he's been getting $2,000 a month for coverage for it. So, you know, he missed seven years of $2,000 a month and couldn't use the money. So, you know, it's not just the care. They don't have to get their care at the VA if they don't want to, but they can still be compensated and get other benefits. So um, so here, they can contact the VA if they want. You know, that's kind of generic and out there. 
Um, they should also sign up for the burn pits registry or the Agent Orange registries, um, and they can um, see that, see those, and I'll talk more about them later. But I think the best first point of contact is the veteran service officer. Um, in every town or region, particularly in Massachusetts, we're very blessed. We have, a, we have a excellent veteran support services. Um, but the veteran service officer is a good place for you to reach out, you know, and get to know who it is, who they are, the, the, the ones that serve your clientele. Not every VSO is the same. And if you're not happy with one, call one from another town and see if they can, have, you know, be a little more helpful for you. But in general, they're, um, they're extremely helpful. They're used to working with veterans. They can answer some of your questions, but they'll do the, the heavy duty interviewing and working with the veteran and connect them with the people that can have, connect them to the correct benefits. So the VSO could be your best friend. And I always tell my students that, you know, whenever you start a new job, you want to get to know the people that you're working with and who are the people in the community that can support you. You know, if you have somebody with domestic violence, who's the best person to turn to? You know, what are the facilities in your area? So that you can do warm handoffs for folks. It's very much appreciated. Um, so why do we not use veteran? We prefer to use former military service uh, because a lot of people don't consider themselves veterans um, because they either are proud of what they did. They don't think that what they did was good enough um that if they're a national guard the national guard has their own rules that are you know more stringent than than other services for being able to call somebody a veteran um and so you know you could have a national guard person who served 20 years on as a national guards person but never deployed you know if it was between certainly before the gulf wars um and they never deployed um, then they would not be considered a veteran because they had not served in combat. I know that the, at least in this state, they're trying to change that, um, which is a good thing because it's, it's really, it's a very sad situation that for people who have served 20 years in any capacity with the military um, and aren't allowed to call themselves a veteran if they want to. Um, the media, you know, it's made people afraid of, of veterans in some ways. Um, and then again, we talked about Vietnam and what an unwelcoming return they got. Oops. Okay, so um, pretty much statistics wise, only about 20 or 30% of former service members are being seen through the VA, which means 70 to 80% of these former service members are being seen by us in the community. Um, and um, many of them may be currently active in the reserves of the National Guard, but they're not eligible for care um, through the VA or through the military system, um, just strictly by virtue of being in the National Guard or reserves. So you're gonna be seeing them as well. So it's an easy question to ask, it can help them determine a diagnosis, understand a person's behavior and connect them to the resources, compensation and pensions that they um, have earned. So we have a lot of veterans in Massachusetts. Um, and again, I'm using veterans because it's a one word rather than former service members, <laughs> which takes a little longer to say and takes up more room on the, on the slide. Um, um, and these numbers don't even include those who are currently serving in the reserves. And there's about 16,000 more folks who are currently serving in the National Guard. Um, and veterans don't don't join the VA. They either hear, you know, they they know they might be eligible, but they just go, it's not worth the trouble. You read on the media how long it takes, the line, you know, they don't have good providers and whatever. You know, if you talk to a veteran about their VA experience, if they happen to use the VA, then you're getting one person's experience. Some people think it's wonderful, it's best thing since sliced bread. Others say I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot bowl. Um, but again. You know, they don't have to get their care there, but they certainly should be able to check to be uh, evaluated for benefits. Um, so the percent of veterans across the state basically is 6.7, 7.9 in Worcester and central Massachusetts. Um, and you can see from the states here, basically, Puerto Rico has 3.8% of their population and Alaska has 13.8. Um, and I mentioned that because the 
people from rural populations often choose to join the military because they want to escape from their rural setting. Um, you know, they want to see the world or for whatever reason. Um, other people join the military because uh, to escape home situations, um, you know, in which they may be victims or abuse, abused. Um, and so, you know, it, there's a wide range of why people join the military. Um, and I think it's important that we understand that and are sensitive. So basically, um, we talked about families a little bit, especially if they're guard or reserves, they face a lot of social isolation. Um, all who um, deploy, if they're married, leave another a spouse or a partner home alone with the kids. Um, if they have them, they're making the decisions. They're learning to live without the, the service member who has departed. And then the service member comes home. Um, and it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, you've missed a whole year and that's not how we do it around here anymore. So that can, you know, um, lead to some, some issues for families. Um, and the children, you know, when a parent is, is away, may act out or, um, and certainly will harbor fears, um, based on the, the news, uh, that they're reading about where their parent is. Um, and so it's important that they get the support that they need, even in a small community where there's, they may be the only one that's departed. So this is just a quick list of the health risks that our service members um, may experience. Um, we'll talk about each one of them in a little bit more detail. Um, I think the musculoskeletal disorders, you know, minimally carry 60 pounds of equipment. And depending, you can carry up to 200, 250 pounds of equipment. Um, you know, the women and the men are expected to do the same. And the equipment that they carry is based on their job, their location, and how far, how long they're going to be away from their, um, their collection point or wherever they're living, if you will. Um, so you may see a lot of muscus, musculoskeletal disorders, um, and it's certainly understandable. Um, and those could be treated um, in the VA um, once they were um, supported by an evaluation. Um, it's also hearing loss, substance abuse, homelessness, suicide, domestic and child abuse. Um, hearing aids, almost everybody who's been in the military loses their hearing. The VA, you know, is pretty good about, you know, giving you um, a service-connected disability for, um, or ser you know, service-connected condition for loss of hearing. Uh, and they provide state-of-the-art hearing aids, and unless it's changed, they replace, they will replace them every two years. So something as small as that, if you have a patient that you could get to, um, you know, to be interested in at least making the effort to try to get their hearing, hearing um, assessed and um, treated. So veterans have a higher rate of hepatitis C infection. This is predominantly from the Vietnam era veterans. Um, you know, if you ask a group why they would say, they'd say, well, they were sexually promiscuous, you know, they were doing drugs, they did this or that. Um, and we really don't know why they have a higher rate of hepatitis C. But I can tell you that um, when I came in during the Vietnam era, uh, and so they were bringing in masses of people at the same time, because remember, this was when we were drafting um, for this war. and. They, um, they, we had to get a ton of uh, immunizations, um, some I'd never even heard of before I got them. And they were giving them expeditiously, they used these things called injection guns. And they would just go from one person to the next with, the, with the, this gun and inject it through the, through the skin. It, it's painful. Um, and the thought is that perhaps as they went from one person to the next, they were spreading the hepatitis C. Again, they, we have nothing to, uh, no research that actually definitively says that's the case. Um, and we still, still try to speculate about it, um, but we just know that they have a higher rate. Um, and the good news is that back in, uh, in 2016, I think the VA said that they would pay for the treatment for anybody with hepatitis C who had served um, in the military. And that was great because the drugs are very pricey. In 2019, um, the full treatment, um, 
the full treatment for this could be as high as 84,000. So it's probably up to 100,000 now for drugs such as Harmony. Um, so again, I think that that, you know, if you think about the folks in the homeless shelters back in those days, if somebody had just recognized that they had been a veteran and they had the time to see, then the whole thing would have been funded through the VA, but they needed to be connected. Um, U.S. Uh, veterans have a 60% greater risk of developing ALS, Gehrig's disease. Um, and this is important. This is regardless of the era or the location in which they have served. So anyone who has ELS, ALS diagnosed and they had 90 days or more of continuous military service, they consider that related to their military service. What does this mean other than a wretched diagnosis um, and future, it means that you are entitled to upwards of $4,000 $4, a month stipend or more, um, home renovations, you get VA care if you need it, respite care for the family, um, as long as it's requested. So, the you know, I mean, it's awful to have that disease, but it, it's more awful to have the disease, be a former service member who served at least 90 days and never have been connected with the services that could at least improve your quality of life as well as that of your family. So we talked about eras, um, and these are the main eras. There was a Cold War between um, Vietnam and the first Gulf War where there were no wars. Um, I really haven't included that because that was basically when the military was was doing a lot of training. We had some smaller missions like Somalia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, but um, you know we don't have much um, literature relics to support those. And certainly, the first Gulf War is often lumped in with Iraq and Afghanistan because it's the same part of the country with some of the same exposures. Um, and then the Camp Lejeune, which is a, a very sad situation, which um, I will explain. And that was a location-based, not era-based. So our World War II veterans, after years and years of silence, um, it was a very much appreciated war, but nobody talked about it when they came home. Um, but now, after those years of silence, Benny will talk about it with pride. Um, They'll wear their hats and will give away the fact that they served. Um, and if you ask them, many of them will, you know, will just go on and on and share with you about their experiences. Some won't, um, but, you know, it's, it's, you can just always offer and listen. Um, I think Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, and all the associated coverage that that got was very wonderful for those who were still living um, and helped to prompt them to, to speak up. Uh, the Korean era veterans are almost as sad as the Vietnam veterans, only because they feel like theirs was the forgotten war. They feel like World War II, you know, you know, got a lot of media. Uh, Vietnam certainly got too much of the negative media, and they feel like, you know, nobody cared about them. Um, so they're very honored if you ask them, and they'll be more than happy to tell you the sacrifices they made and what they did. They know it was important and they're proud of having served, but, um, and some of them will wear their baseball caps now more and more, I'm noticing. But basically they were exposed to cold weather and ionizing, ionizing radiation, which could lead to um, certain diseases. Uh, Vietnam, so Agent Orange was a defoliant, a tactical herbicide that was used by the military to clear vegetation for better uh, site siting for their military operations in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Um, Agent Orange carried um, toxins, including dioxin. And interestingly, it became known as Agent Orange because of the orange striping on the barrels that were used for shipping it. Um, so for 30 years, maybe 40 years, people from Vietnam were getting sick and dying, um, and nobody had really looked into it. Um, but since 1994, approximately every two years, Congress has mandated updates by the National Academy of Sciences, where they review um, peer-reviewed um, uh, articles for evidence to support or not the various health concerns. So 
sure you just, you, you know, I don't expect you to know or remember any of these other than the fact that there's a lot of really awful diseases on this, in this graph, on this chart, on the table rather. Um, so if you have a person with a Vietnam uh, who served in Vietnam, um, you know, it might be worth finding out whether their particular disease or illness that they're presenting with um, might actually be associated with Agent Orange. And then in, in, in 2015, and then more recently, they've come out with dementia related to uh, Agent Orange, as well as um, the combination of Agent Orange and PTSD, increasing the risk of, of dementia. And again, this is a compensable disease once it's diagnosed and evaluated through the VA system. I mean, you can't just call up and say, I've got a patient who served in Vietnam and he's got dementia, um, you know, could you please send him a check or take care of him? They, the VA puts them through the process, you know, they might need to appeal at least once or whatever, um, but it's, it's definitely worth it um, to look into that. Um, and again, as I said, I, the new information just keeps coming across my desk. So in June of 21, um, they added in bladder cancer, hypothyroidism, and Parkinson's disease to the diseases that were presumptively associated with Agent Orange. Um, and then again, recently, um, so this was 20, this was in January 21. Um, they're now saying that the Agent Orange exposure um, is. It means that those folks could be twice as likely to get dementia, and even when you adjust for the, those three um, conditions. We don't know what the, what the mechanism is that is underlying this association. I'm just checking my watch. I'm in a hurry. Um, so, but I can tell you that it's all being studied now, finally, after all these years. Camp Lejeune, North Carolina is a marine base. It's probably one of the largest marine base U.S. Marine bases in the country, and the Navy's sailors are often assigned there in support of the Marines. Thousands pass through Camp Lejeune every year for varying periods of time, um, and the water was contaminated um, with industrial pollutants such as benzene for over 30 years, between 1953 and 1987. So VA care is provided for related issues, which you'll see on the next slide, if a person or a family were there for 30 or more days. And this is one of the few times when um, family members are also included. Um, I failed to mention when we were looking at Agent Orange of Vietnam um, that um, there were a lot of, or there were significant number of um, children who were born with issues. Um, and some of those are also covered through, um, through the VA and with compensation. Um, so, and for these current medical conditions, I'm sure more will be um, you know, discovered or evaluated as being associated. Um, the soldiers, sailors, and their families' health care costs are covered, uh, as well as there could be some compensation. I'm not that familiar with that. The current uh, Gulf Wars, um, going back to the one in 1990, the one in 1991, when Iraq invaded uh, Kuwait to get access to the oil in the Persian Gulf, so far, these are the dying diseases that have been associated with deployment there. And um, those are based on exposures, which we have in the next one. Um, no. So anyway, they're, they're based on burn pit exposures, um, toxic oil wells that were set afire, and also from uh, the demolition of, of chemicals um, and the wind currents that would carry um, the debris from that down and contaminated the folks that were um, both in Iraq, in the Kuwait, and in Saudi Arabia. So we'll talk in a minute about burn pit exposure. So anyone who's been uh, stationed or deployed to any of the areas of the Gulf should, jo should join the burn pit registry. So then at least you're on the list. And then as things come up and they discover different associations, um, you're, you're covered for that. So TBI, traumatic brain injury, is the signature injury from the current wars. Um, and it's interest, there's doing a lot of research with TBI, which is sad, but it's also fascinating. Um, and basically, they're finding that the brains of veterans from the Gulf War on Terror, who later died of other causes, 
show an unusual honeycomb pattern of broken and swollen nerve fibers in the portion of the brain that controls the executive function. These brain changes differ from brain damage resulting from motor vehicle accidents, drug overdoses, and impact sports. Um, and so we also are finding that some soldiers did not feel the explosion, but actually um, experienced one. So again, it's, it's something you want to be pretty sensitive to um, if you're seeing uh, someone who has served or deployed in these recent wars. <coughs> when executive function breaks down, <coughs> sometimes a person's behavior becomes poorly controlled. They can't switch focus. They can't remember details. They, um, so it can affect their ability to work, go to school, or um, maintain appropriate social relationships. And this may explain some of the, the homelessness, some of the supporting housing supportive housing needs that are needed by some of the veterans who just seem to have the most trouble adjusting that to uh, civilian life. So again, this is where it's important to find out, then that could explain your behavior. And I suspect that this is one of the reasons why certainly our EMTs who are out there right at the moment of whatever the emergency situation is, um, might want to know and have a better appreciation for what's explaining you know, the unusual behavior, if you will, perhaps, of the person that they're caring for. Um, again, moral injury has only been on the radar for less than a decade. Um, and again, as I said, this is the injury to the soul. Um, and it's doing things that, you know, at another time or place might have gotten you into prison or even on death row. Um, so you can see it's pretty hard to change your value system depending on the situation that you're in. Um, and so we just want to keep that on the radar screen and stay tuned because I think we're going to get a lot more um, interest and support and research on moral injury. Um, I include this again just because these things keep coming across. They keep adding different um, disease processes to um, to the possibility of a presumptive diseases that would be compensable and offered care. So again, I don't expect you to remember anything. I just would hope that you would remember, gee, this person served, they served in you know, Vietnam or they served in Afghanistan. I wonder if whatever we're seeing now could possibly be associated with that. Um, some of the more recent ones now, they've added chronic asthma, rhinitis, and sinusitis, um, you know, type 2 diabetes, hypertension. Some of these things have been associated, but it's not, you know, it's not a slam dunk. You know, again, they have to go through the process of being evaluated through the VA. So why do we care about the branch of service? You saw this slide earlier. Well, this is going to give you more additional information now when you're considering the risks that we've just discussed. So, for example, so Army veterans have the greatest incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder from the global war of terror, terrorism. Um, but if you look and you see the distribution, so if you've got an Air Force person, you know, it's much less likely that they're going to have PTSD. Not that they won't, but they're less likely based on the job that they have as they support the fighting troops. Um, the Army has 67% of the cases, which that's understandable because of the large infantry forces that we have. Um, the Navy, the folks are out on a ship. So anyway, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I am an Army veteran, and uh, we have a, a lot more challenging than the Navy and the Air Force. So there's a lot of competition between the different branches. I love them all, or, you know, except when we're on the football field or whatever. But um, the interesting thing about this slide is you look at the Marines who have jobs that are very similar to those of the Army and sometimes even, even more harsh, um, and they're only 13%. And so um, it's it, one you, may, you wonder, what is it about the Marines? What is it about who they recruit or who join? Or is it resilience that they bring? Or is it resilience maybe that they... Um, that is being instilled in them through their training. Um, so that'd be a great research study for, for someone to, to look into. And sadly, um, if you within the Army um, and the branches, it's 
the guard and the reserve who suffer the most from the mental health conditions upon return, um, as well as um, the PTS. Um, so I can tell you that um, we, one of our psychiatrists here from the Department of Psychiatry worked with the Mass, uh, Massachusetts Army National Guard to study their rates of suicide completions um, because it was, it was so high a number of years ago. And I can tell you that the gentleman who, who was involved with that with the psychiatry department has gone on and he's now heading up Home Base, which is um, in Boston which is an amazing resource for anybody that you may identify who is, suffers from moral injury, PTS. Um, it's free, it's beautiful, it's, it's paid for by the Red Sox Foundation and Mass General. They offer incredible services. They'll pay for the, for the former service member and the family to go. Um, and um, they can stay, they stay two weeks and they really work with them. It's just amazing. It's an absolutely gorgeous facility. It's right um, on the water at the same, near the USS Constitution. Um, I mean, it's, it's exquisite. They put them up at a Marriott hotel. So there's so many rich resources um, that it's important to, you know, try to connect the, your folks who are struggling. Um, so, yeah, the, the strain of deployment, again, predominantly on the, the front line, the supportive uh, troops and healthcare providers um, come back with some, some issues, mental health, which most of which are treatable um, as long as you can help them out. PTSD, keep an eye on that. Um, they're starting this psych cognitive psychedelic assisted therapy. They're, they're doing clinical trials. Harvard is doing it. Um, I heard a sergeant who spoke about his treatment. Um, this is where they use MDMA, LSD, ecstasy, psilocybin, and uh, ketamine, various things. Um, and they, the, they administer those to the, to the veteran uh, or the patient. And then it's very intensive therapy with one or two uh, behavioral therapists working with the, the veteran. Um, and the, the research, the outcomes so far are pretty exceptional. So um, I think it's very, it makes me feel very hopeful, but it's also got to be very expensive given the intensity of the, you know, and the duration of eight to 16 hours maybe of intense therapy. And the, the, the one, the, the study that I was heard about um, in the con in the conference proceedings was uh, that the, the day it was two days in a row, but to hear the sergeant who had tried to, um, you know, who had considered suicide, had attempted suicide on a number of times, and to hear him talk about his life before and his life and how it was changed after that therapy is pretty pretty exciting. So, um, and we're getting near the end. I just wanted you to know this is what one of the medical students. Um, so it was the value of having learned that how important it was to ask the question. So I'll let you read it. And I have her permission, obviously. Um, so 20 to 22 veterans choose to end their lives. Um, of these, only five are enrolled and we're likely seeing the rest of them. And it's usually within a month or so before they um, are successful. So in summary, um, there's, you know, so far we've got about 13 to 15 diseases that we know are related to Agent Orange. We've got 15 or more related to uh, Camp Lejeune, the contaminated water, uh, nine plus associated with the Gulf War. And then we talked about TBI, PTSD, and the other battlefield and other injuries from the Gulf War on terrorism. And you may be the one to connect these folks um, and those who are eligible to, for VA services, benefits, and possibly compensation for their sacrifice. So what's the best way to thank your former service members upon meeting them or completing an interview? Um, and this was from, these are from folks um, who um, have had a lot of experience. Um, you can say, you can say thank you for your service, which was, I think initially it was great 
because it was people were finally really appreciating people for what they have done for the country. Um, but then it began to be perceived by some veterans as being trite. Um, so these are some that were suggested that would seem to be more genuine. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences in the military so I can continue to learn, do my best to care for you and others who have served. Thank you for the sacrifices you made for our country. Or I personally appreciate your having served. So we talked a little bit earlier about veteran service officers in most of the towns. Um, Again, that, that could be your first go-to person. Um, the outpatient VA clinics, you have quite a few out west, Greenfield, Pittsfield, um, Springfield, and then closer we have Fitchburg and Worcester. Worcester's getting a brand new one that opens up in December. The ribbon cutting is um, November 8th, next week. So we're very excited about that. It's right here on the campus of UMass. Um, patients, you know, former service members can walk into these clinics and ask for help to either sign up and enroll in the VA or ask questions. Do you, do you think this is compensable? Do you think that this is, you know, is service related? The vet centers, um, you have one in Springfield, there's one in Athol, there's one in Worcester, but the side of the state, again, the patient can walk in for help. Vet centers are good because they'll take care of people who were dishonorably discharged no matter what type of papers they got when they got out of the service. They'll also help folks who have bad discharge papers, maybe because of that they had a TBI or they, you know, they had moral injury or they had some issue that prompted their behavior not to be exemplary and appreciated by the military. So the vet centers and these others can, are now working uh, legally with folks to try to reinstate their um, discharge as other than that dishonorable so that they are eligible for services. And you also out west have home-based primary care, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, we don't, I don't have it here, but you have physicians and nurses and uh, and uh, social workers and CNAs and a variety of people who are working as a team when they go into the home or to excuse me, to see veterans who are um, unable for some reason to come in. Um, to a clinic. So um, kudos to you for having that. Um, I hear nothing but good things about it. We have, I have students who are out there who made a point of coming up just yesterday to tell me what a great experience it is and how much they've learned and, you know, how much they're enjoying caring for veterans. So these are some of the resources. There's a ton of resources out there through the VA and the Department of Defense. Um, the AAMC, um, the medical school, um, you know, main association, association, accreditation association for medical colleges and universities. Um, basically, these are the, they tell you the questions that they suggest you ask. This is a very good format. In general, it's non-threatening. Um, and so, you know, when you're talking to the veteran, you know, embrace silence, give them opportunities to continue, say, tell me more. Um, and many of them, it's a catharsis to be able to talk that somebody's finally asked them. So you can also go to this QR code um, on the VA, and this is a Veterans Health Military Health History Guide. Um, we caution you with this one because this is what, you know, this is for VA providers. So the person is seeing, you know, in being seen in the VA because they've already been approved for care. Um, and it's an ongoing relationship, but this gets into more asking, you know, more about some of the experiences that they have that could, could be causing the moral injury or the PTSD or getting to the aspects of military sexual assault. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to jump in and ask that question. You don't want to jump in and say, gee, did you kill anybody? Um, you really have to be very careful. And so that's why I, Personally, prefer the double AMC, the one we looked at before, um, because if you establish a good relationship, eventually you may get to the other issues that are very sensitive. But, you know, it's a total turnoff if you start right out with a sensitive question. So um, I just encourage the, at least our medical students and, and other providers to use caution. It's a very good card. It has really good ideas and suggestions. And it's kind of a nice thumbnail summary of some of the issues that they are that are based on the eras. Um, but again, I would I would go with the questions as we've been 
discussing them in depth data and presented. Um, so as healthcare providers, some of us love the adrenaline rush. Um, you know, emergency room folks, they work there because they like it generally. ICU, we like it. That's why we went to choose ICU. That's why a lot of people choose, you know, going to uh, coming in the military, joining the infantry or whatever. Um, so we have a sense of, of that adrenaline, you know, the rush that we like. Um, but this is a really good uh, video by Sebastian Younger, who's written some really good books related to the military. Um, and it talks about why veterans miss war. And you, those of us who like the adrenaline rush can really appreciate this because you can see how it works. So again, in closing, it's important for those who have no history of military service to appreciate the increased risk um, and disability of our veterans and the lifelong impact that can have. And if you don't ask, they won't tell you. So this is my last slide. Um, after this, there's just a lot of references, but I think that this is a particularly poignant slide, and I'm going to leave it up for a while um, and give you a couple, you know, a minute or so to read it, because I think it really, it tells so accurately what uh, many of our Vietnam veterans um, have experienced and, and why their lives have been so difficult since they have returned. So, John and Marion and Ida, I'm happy to make the slides available if you want them. Uh, there's a lot on them. <laughs> so Dr. Hale, that, that was exceptional. It was, um, you covered so much ground there. And uh, I just want to say, I mean, I think it's uh, profound that uh, we live in a state that has taken so much uh, time and effort and resources to educate our future medical care professionals. Um, it, it's, it, and I know I've, I've mentioned this before to many people that I'm proud to be in a, from a state that um, has a flagship medical school that has really embraced um, this sense of, you know, what it means to serve, why it's important, and why to educate healthcare pro professionals about the unique circumstances of military life. So first and foremost, I wanna extend my gratitude to you for an exceptional uh, lecture, and and I'll, and I'll say for for those that are um, that are here as participants today, and then I, I do want to hear from folks that have questions. Um, that this was a foundation. So, in the weeks to follow, we are going to delve into many many of the topics that uh, Dr. Hale discussed today, um, from areas involving post traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury. Uh, suicide prevention, um, the role that military family members play and and um, treatment and care for our family members because they serve as well. Um, we're going to cover a lot of those areas. We're going to get we're going to delve into community re reintegration aspects and why community support uh, is so important to a veteran's well-being when they return from home, return home from war. And uh, I learned so much just uh, in the in the, the the way that you present asking questions and, uh, and i think that's there are so many takeaways from this um presentation i hope uh participants uh, took good notes and um and will join us in this subsequent weeks to learn even more about these particular areas of concentration so thank you thank you john i enjoyed it i hope it was valuable and I hope if I told any lies or was in, anything was in <laughs> it changes fast. So, you know, what's true today may not be true tomorrow. So keep me honest. No, it was, it was spectacular. Uh, I particularly like um, that you recognize that there are many things that healthcare providers can do in a short amount of time that can make 
a huge difference in that veteran's life or a family member's life just to ask the simple question, do you have a history of U.S. military service uh, for you or in your family? Um, that can set off an entire sequence of additional questions and, and introspection that can, you know, really, truly um, change that person's life um, in, in such a substantial way. Um, enrolling in VA healthcare, um, connecting with that community municipal veteran service officer. We tell every veteran that, you know, we have uh, the benefit in our state uh, as part of chapter 115 in our state, uh, which is a pioneer across the nation in having local services. So if each of us as citizens and certainly for, for, for you all as healthcare providers to have that information, can really put a veteran on a positive trajectory, um, just having that basic um, ability to ask those basic questions at the very beginning. When you paid attention, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> so a couple things, and then please ask away if anyone has questions. Um, so we do have the attendance code listed. It's in the chat room if you missed it earlier. It's S-O-K-Q-A-B. If you text the code to the phone number 413-200-2444, that's 200-2444, that's going to mark you as having attended the conference and allow you to continue to evaluate the course and collect the credits earned. So that's important, right? Um, and then the other uh, big thing is Dr. Hill mentioned about the slides. So if you have interest in these slides, perhaps some. Um, uh, send send an email to either Marion Talbot at Bay State, and we can look at ways to get it to you. Um, and of course, uh, this is recorded and will be placed on the Bay State platform, so you'll have access to this information. And please share it. Um, you know, there's uh, Dr. Hale really covered a lot of uh, from A to Z, honestly, uh, about uh, the unique circumstances involving uh, military service. So there's a, a wealth of information here that that really needs to be shared with as many healthcare providers as possible. So if that could be a, a call to action for all of us is to share this information, we'll all be better providers and, and better uh, friends and family members of veterans. So thank you all. Uh, questions, please. So I do have one question here in the chat room. Um, somebody had asked if you would describe the burn pit. What are they? Oh. <laughs> Sure. Um, so well, I can I, I'll use my own experiences from uh, from 1991, but it's it's been the same in Afghanistan. I just didn't go there. Um, they, um, you know, we you're placed out in the desert basically, and the status of forces agreement was that we would leave the, the the ground exactly as we found it, which was pretty much a desolate desert. <laughs> Um, but in order to do that, you know, there's no garbage or sewer or anything like that. Everything goes in the burn pit, you know, from chemicals to medical supplies to uh, body parts, you know, pieces, you know, organs, whatever happened, you know, from surgery, um, all of the the uh, excreta from the, the people that are living there, um, as well as from patients, everything goes into this burn pit, you know, and then they throw a bunch of MOGAS, which is jet fuel in it. I don't know if that's what they're still using. And then they throw in a couple of matches and it kind of blows up and, you know, destroys everything. Um, and, you know, some munitions might get thrown in there. Who knows? But it it, it creates really a wretched horrible stench that you're then subsequently inhaling. Um, and so pretty much that's what the burn pits are. I can also tell you um, that from the, the, the Gulf War, some of the, when they were burning the oil wells, um, then the, the oil and the grease and the fumes of that, depending on which way the wind was blowing, was, a, was you know, exposed those of us, you know, in the downwind um, with with all of that, you know, you could feel the you could feel the oil on your face and see it glistening on your helmet and your uniform. Um, so, yeah, so there's just, you know, just 
it's just a means of, of burning everything. Um, and then people are inhaling it. Dr. Hale, I'll say for the person to ask that question, David, that on uh, January 19th, we will have uh, an entire session devoted to military environmental uh, health exposures, where uh, we'll have a VA uh, practitioner, a person who directs the program at the VA, um, and, and she'll go through in great detail about burn pits, about the, um, the toxic exposures that our veterans uh, uh, really from um, throughout many generations to include Agent Orange. I know Dr. Hill mentioned uh, Agent Orange, but she'll cover the whole uh, the whole litany of various uh, exposures that uh, veterans have during their military service. So mark that down. Uh, I don't think that's yet on the base state uh, registration page, but January 19th, uh, we'll have uh, a nurse uh, practitioner, Kelly Lovin, will be providing that, uh, that particular uh, session. So thank you for the question. And, and John, could you make sure that, I don't know how, I mean, I'm not from Bay State, but I'd like to attend those subsequent sessions because, you know, I mean, I know what I know, but I know there's more, much more that I don't know. Um, so I'd love to participate for the remainder of the sessions if that's possible. Absolutely. We'd love to have you join on on every possible one that you can. I know your your uh, livelihood is so busy there at UMass, but uh, by all means, uh, we hope we, you can join as many as you can. Thank you. Great, thanks. Yep. Did you get a flyer, Dr. Hale? I did. Yep. Oh, okay. Excellent. We the one you sent me, the one I, that you sent a long time ago. Oh, I'll send a new one. Okay. We don't have the January ones yet. I don't think listed on them, but and yeah. we're we're planning a a, a number. Where, you know, the, our idea is to uh, make this. Um, you know, we're going to continue this into the next calendar year, include more topics. Uh, if folks have ideas for us at a, a particular area of interest or something at their own practice, um, at their at their healthcare system, they want to know more about, uh, we will add speakers as as we go along. Um, at, you know, we're we really want to evolve this into something that is going to uh, be very rich in the amount of information we provide. So I see we have a couple of more minutes. Any other questions that folks might have? All right, then I, I show that it's uh, 1330 hours here. Um, Bay State, just uh, if you know in the chat room, they're gonna post the recordings to the Bay State Health YouTube channel. So you can have this information and you can share it again. If you could please share this with others within your network, uh, colleagues and friends, that would be spectacular. And, uh, and join us next week. Uh, this is a lunchtime series. We'll be back next Wednesday at noon. We're going to be covering community reintegration efforts. So thank you, one and all. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Hale. My pleasure. pleasure. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hale. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.